going to do, first of all, what I'd like to do is introduce each one of our speakers, then I'll turn over to them. Um, we are limited in time, so each of these presentations will be about 10, maybe 12 minutes long. So uh, uh, there won't be time for questions, but each one of them will be hosting a table talk afterwards. And I believe they'll be at, um, these speakers will be at one, two, and three tables. And then you'll look in, um, in your program and you'll see all of the rest of the table talks that will be taking place. <clears throat> so, first of all, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is John Nielsen Gammon. Um, he is PhD, Regents Professor at Texas A&M. Uh, he is also our Texas State Climatologist. Um, he's also a meteorologist, and um, with a lot of different research projects that he has been involved with, uh, some of those have included climate variability, as well as heavy rainfall events. So, very fitting that, it, that he is here today. Thank you. Our second speaker this morning will be Stephanie Glenn from HART. Uh, she is director, program director of hydrology and watersheds. Uh, in the last year, she was involved as project lead uh, to research and compile um, an interactive online map that really goes through all of the different environmental impacts of Harvey. So she will be going through that with you. And then thirdly, our speaker is Glenn Miracle. I think a lot of people here know Glenn. Um, for the last 17 years, he's been a local farmer. He practices regenerative architect, uh, not architecture, sorry, <laughs> agriculture. Um, my background is architecture. But um, um, yeah, regenerative agriculture. Uh, he has a 21 acre laughing frog farm. Uh, what I found interesting about him was that this is a second career for him. Um, his only farming experience before then was a vegetable garden in Houston. So, very interesting, it's gonna be fascinating. So with that, I'd like to turn over to John, and then we'll just, each speaker will go, um, and then we'll break for table talks. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, the, the theme for this meeting is the surprising back to Harvey, I'm going to start by talking about how surprising Harvey was in the first place. Uh, here is the uh, clicker that doesn't actually... Oh, it's pointed to the back of it. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Got to, did that have to squeeze hard. I've got to pump up my left hand here. Okay, so um, Harvey set a record for her greatest uh, storm total at any gauge in the United States, but what causes flooding is rainfall that occurs over a area. And these are the records prior to Harvey for different lengths of storms, two days, uh, five days, 1,000 square miles to 50,000. Know, um, Harris County is, is 1,700 some odd square miles, typical county in Texas about 1,000. So we're talking about multi-county side areas here. So that's, and this is all storms uh, anywhere in the United States. Um, maybe we miss a few West Coast storms with the small areas, because you can get pretty dense rains in the Olympic Peninsula, for example, but definitely the, the larger areas are United States wide. So that's before Harvey. Um, this is after Harvey. <laughs> sort of rewrote the record books there. Um, we'll have to look into that one remaining storm, make sure it's legit. <laughs> but um, Harvey, we know it was exceptional for Houston. Sometimes it's hard to recognize how exceptional it was for the entire United States. And in terms of those records, I'll give you one example here. Uh, for a five day storm total over a 10,000 square mile area, these were the previous records. The average rainfall over that size area. Um, there was a storm back in 1899, which was one of the major floods on the Brazos River, which actually takes the top spot, although it's kind of hard to say how much rain fell over a large area when there are only a few gauges available. We know, we know it made a lot of rain because it produced a lot of flooding. Uh, Hurricane Beulah in South Texas in 1967 is pretty high on the list. You can find the Louisiana storm back in the summer of 2016 is number four on the list. That one people, uh, I suppose, are more likely to remember than the 1899 event. 
Um, and so now we'll add in Harvey. Whoops, hang on. Uh, 33 inches of rain, it devastated the record. You know, 33 inches is this much. It's, uh, it's impressive when it happens on a single occasion. That's the average over 10,000 square miles. So uh, when I part that area, got more rain than that. Um, another aspect of the historic rainfall is looking at it in the context of change over time. So our experience with flooding is generally based on a fairly short time window. I, I don't know what the average length of time is for uh, adults presently in Harris County who have been in Harris County. Probably something like 10 or 15 years might be the average. So you got a pretty short time window of experience. But even if you look all the way back to before 1900, we see a fairly dramatic trend in the sorts of events that cause at least localized flooding. Eight inches of rain over, over a two day period is generally enough to produce a lot of rain. And in fact, the odds of it happening um, at any given location historically uh, were about uh, 0.2, which means about once every five years you might actually see something like that. But the, the trend in our experience is a significant increase. Another way of looking at it is um, the maximum seven day event. You know, looking at the whole storm, such as Harvey, and look at a slightly broader perspective. Um, so, this is actually um, centered on hurricane season, July through November, and goes back to about 1950, which is when we started having lots of rain gauges available. And you can see a fairly dramatic trend in rainfall um, from about five inches being your typical annual maximum to uh, close to eight inches today. Uh, that actually doesn't include Harvard. Um, when you look at trends like this, usually you actually uh, exclude the event that inspired the search because you know that's going to cause a trend upward. You're looking for a trend where you know there is one. But even if you take that event away, there's still this dramatic trend. And if we act, actually put on Harvey, that total would be about 25, 26 inches would be off the charts, literally. Okay, so it's important, of course, to look at these trends uh, because there are reasons to expect trends to continue. Again, the total 33 inches, there have been several studies that have already come out looking at how much of that rain can be attributed to uh, that long-term trend. Uh, if you just look at historical data, you can't really say why it happened, but you can say how much of a trend there was. And here I've highlighted a couple of studies which give fairly dramatic differences in their estimate. Um, an increase of like 15% from one study, an increase of close to 50% compared to the beginning of the 20th century with another study. And so that causes a bit of a problem when you're trying to plan for the future because you don't know how big that trend is supposed to be. You don't know what to prepare for. Um, one of these studies, the, the, the Van Oldenborg study, actually looked at um, not just the historical trend, but also what global climate models predict for the historical trend given the changes in the atmospheric composition that we've seen over that period. And actually the models give a similar answer to what's observed. Plus we know that um, there should be an increase just from warmer temperatures because you get more moisture in the atmosphere. So when you've got a star producing rain, it's producing typically more rain. And that can even feed back on the storm. There's evidence that the more intense storms actually get into this uh, positive feedback, which gives you a bigger increase than you even expect from temperature change. Um, and that's consistent with both of these studies. 
So how do you get this difference? Well, remember this plot I showed you a minute ago. Um, you have to remember it because I can't click on it. There we go. Um, so that's actually from the study that came up with the bigger estimate of rainfall change. Um, the trend you get depends upon how you frame the question and how you look at it. So we actually do have data going back to 1900. And if you use the same data set and go back farther, you get a trend which is only about a third as large. And it turns out if you look at a slightly different <coughs> set of months, if you include June, which had Allison, which you might think would enhance the trend, well, no, it actually reduces the trend. If you look at a larger geographical area, which is one thing that the other study did, it reduces the trend also. So it is a challenge to pin down how much of a trend it should be. And in fact, uh, if you look at individual counties in Texas, Harris County's trend is larger in terms of the heavy rainfall, even without Harvey, than just about any other county in the state. Um, so you can look at it in terms of rainfall. I've also looked at it in terms of storm motion, you know, because the main thing about Harvey was it stalled. And uh, this is the number of stalling storms along a coastline anywhere in North and Central America over the past century and a half. And we see there has been an increase also in this, but again, you have to be careful because storms weren't tracked as diligently in the early part of that period. Uh, if you limit yourself to when we actually have satellite data, you can't discern a trend, so that's an open question also. So it's really hard to deal with the future when you don't know exactly what the future is going to be. I mean, we never really knew exactly what the future was going to be. Purpose of designing for resiliency is to be able to deal with a range of possible futures. So, conclusion from my first part of my talk, um, odds of Harvey-like rainfall have definitely increased, and because of why they increased, they're going to continue to increase. Um, the odds of the hurricane stalling may have increased also, but Houston in particular has experienced trends which are larger than what had happened historically in other places. And that means something interesting for the future for Harvey and how people are dealing with the future. So back to this graph again. This is the historical experience. The part right at the end, that big uptick, is most people's recent experience. So I suspect that most Houstonians, or at least many of them, uh, are seeing this trend that's happened and expecting it's going to continue at a similar remarkable pace. Not, you know, frequent Harvey stars perhaps, but, you know, when we have year after year after year of flooding, that starts to be the norm. On the other hand, uh, a lot of Houstonians didn't actually experience flooding during Harvey. And while they recognized it as a big event, their experience with the likelihood of flooding is much lower. So you've got this diversity of expectations. And even though Harvey was exceptional, it still only set records for stream flow in bayous in Harris County in about 60% uh, of the bodies, which means 40% of them hardly wasn't exceptional. There were events that were worse. And so people who might think, well, we survived Harvey without a big problem, are a lot more vulnerable now than people who actually were affected by Harvey. Now, engineers. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, have to deal with es estimating trends and well frequencies of extreme rainfall events, extreme flood events. The paradigm for doing that is the odds of what happened in the past are consistent with the odds in the future. And I mean no disrespect to engineers that they don't take into account climate change because there's no 
good quantitative way to factor that in in terms of estimating these are the odds of a hundred uh, uh, you know the hundred year event this is the amount to expect because we don't have a precise number there's no established way of dealing with that um, so that's a challenge um, you can deal with it by in policy by allowing for a bigger margin of error designing for events which are historically less frequent than you normally design for, a 500 year event rather than a 100 year event, because that sort of takes into account the trends that have happened. Now, here is, hopefully, I was going to show you what I think, but apparently I can't show you what I think. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there we go. Okay, I did it. So if you look at trends over a large area of Texas, um, you get something that looks sort of like that, that red line there, that the odds of very extreme events have not quite doubled. Now, the more extreme it goes, the more unusual the event is, the greater the odds increase. They go from something really small to something bigger. But, that's what I think is going on with the trend, right? if, if you look at statistically over a long area, which means Houston has been especially unlucky in terms of the flooding they've experienced. I think you already knew that. But it also means Houston is exceptionally lucky in that what people's experiences of flooding and awareness of flooding actually gives them an estimated risk which is consistent with what is going to be the real risk in the future as these trends continue. So in that respect, uh, it depends upon what people do in response to Harvard, in response to this perception of increased risk, but overestimating it now actually lets people give a realistic estimate of risk that will apply to the future. Okay, thank you.